Hello, this is part five of Questioning Ochelan's Jewish Question by the most excellent Chaya Heller. Question four. Why does Ochelan celebrate the Jews he condemns? Fourth, I ask why Ochelan presents contradictory views of Jewish people. After presenting Jewish people as a negative historical force driving capitalist modernity and the nation-state, why does Ochelan also lionise Jewish intellectuals, scientists and leftists, claiming that democratic modernity is impossible without them? The answer is that most racist narratives are contradictory, emphasising both positive and negative features of objectified racialized groups. By celebrating positive traits, traits of denigrated groups, racist narratives can appear balanced and fair-minded. In the case of anti-Jewish racism, a contradictory view of Jews also makes anti-Jewish racism plastic and multi-purposeful, appealing to a wide range of audiences. For example, leftists who scorn bad Jewish capitalists can admire Karl Marx, Leon Trotsky, Emma Goldman or Rosa Luxemburg. Those who scorn Judeo-Bolsheviks can laud Jewish capitalists such as Sheldon Adelson or the Kushners. Philo-Semitism is a form of anti-Jewish racism that reduces a vast array of diverse Jewish people to a positive essence or stereotypes. Positive and negative racist stereotypes are equally damaging because they both per perpetuate typological thinking and racialized systems of domination. For example, in the white supremacist United States, the same people who view black people negatively often hold genuinely good feelings about black excellence in domains such as sports, music and entertainment. Praise for individuals associated with black excellence in these limited areas coexists quite comfortably with racist paternalism towards black people and avoidance of the broader problem of systemic anti-black racism. Ochelan's philo-Semitic praise for individual Jewish intellectuals similarly obscures the social and political obstacles that historically made their contributions difficult for most Jewish people to attain, and serves as cover for assessing them as a discrete and unitary group about which sweeping stereotypes may be drawn. Ochelan writes, if we mention names like Spinoza in the emergence of contemporary philosophy, Marx in sociology, Freud in psychology, and Einstein in physics, and add hundreds of theorists of the arts, science, and political theory, we would get a sufficient impression of Jewish intellectual strength. Can the dominance of the Jews in the world of intellect be denied? Ochelan's philo-Semitic praise for the dominance of the Jews in the world of intellect is ahistorical. Individuals such as Marx, who didn't identify as Jewish, Freud or Einstein contributed to the world of intellect not due to their Jewish identity but despite it. Ochelan doesn't note that most Jewish people living during the time of Marx or Freud were uneducated and illiterate. For hundreds of years leading up to the Holocaust, the vast majority of European Jewish people led unremarkable, toilsome lives. Especially in Poland and the Russian Empire, where the bulk of European Jewish people lived, they were largely poor, rural, uneducated and excluded from intellectual or professional society. Philo-Semitism makes for stunning contradictions. After repeatedly condemning Jews for their alleged connection to capitalist modernity, Ochelan celebrates a strong Jewish wing of democratic modernity. He writes, It would be insufficient and wrong to think of Judaism only in connection to capitalism, modernity and the nation-state. Jews also exerted a strong influence on democratic modernity. Even if this influence fails to match that of the power-oriented statist wing, e.g. the Kingdom of Judah and the State of Israel, there has always been a strong Jewish wing of democratic civilization and modernity. 
Oshelan's ideas about Jewish people are clear. While good Jews lean towards democratic modernity, bad Jews lean towards capitalism and the nation state. But ultimately, for Oshelan, the Jewish statist wing is the more powerful of the two. Oshelan's philo-Semitism surfaces perhaps most intensely when he speaks of Jewish people in leftist movements. He writes, What prophetic movement, what fraternity and solidarity of the poor, what utopian socialist, anarchist, feminist or ecological movement is conceivable without Jews? Likewise, philosophical schools, scientific and artistic movements and religious denominations are hardly conceivable without Jews. How far could socialism have developed against capitalism, internationalism against nation-statism, communalism against liberalism, feminism against social sexism, ecological economy against industrialism, laicism against religionism, or relativism against universalism without Jews? Ochelan's philo-Semitic claims pose themselves as a counterbalance to his negative assertions that Jewish survival strategies cause harm to others. He lists Jewish contributions to political life, acknowledging Jewish socialists, anarchists, feminists and ecologists, as well as Jewish philosophers, scientists, artists and religious people. He further writes, from the time of Ishmael, the son of the prophet Abraham and his concubine Hagar, to Joseph, who was taken to Egypt as a slave, and from Miriam, the sister of Moses, through Mary, the mother of Jesus, to the present, the list encompasses prophets, scribes, intellectuals, social anarchists, feminists, philosophers, scientists, and together with its labourers, the other side of Judaism has produced great discoveries, inventions, theories, revolutions and works of art in the struggle for democratic civilization and modernity. This celebration of Jews only further reveals his confusion about Jewish history. In discussing Jewish, Christian and Muslim religious historical figures, Oshelan posits the three religions as if they form a unitary whole. He fails to note that Christianity and Islam are not extensions of a mythical Jewish power or Jewish ideology. Rather, Christianity and Islam are powerful institutions that worked within various state powers to tyrannise Jewish people for centuries. Oshelan's celebration of good Jewish leftists also obscures the long legacy of left anti-Jewish racism that has always marginalised Jewish people in broader leftist movements, a shameful history of which Oshelan's own identification of Jewish people with capital and state power is but a small recent part. French utopian thinker Charles Fourier regarded Jewish people as greedy, parasitical and deceitful. In turn, French anarchist Pierre-Joseph Proudhon denounced Jewish people as the incarnation of finance capitalism and declared that the Jew is the enemy of humankind, they must be sent back to Asia or be exterminated. Russian revolutionary anarchist Mikhail Bakunin described Jewish people thusly. This whole Jewish world, comprising a single exploiting sect, a kind of blood-sucking people, a kind of organic destructive collective parasite, going beyond not only the frontiers of states but of political opinion, this world is now, at least for the most part, at the disposal of Marx on the one hand and of Rothschild on the other. This may seem strange. What can there be in common between socialism and a leading bank? The point is that authoritarian socialism, Marxist communism, demands a strong centralisation of the state, and where there is centralisation of the state, there must necessarily be a central bank, and where such a bank exists, the parasitic Jewish nation, speculating with the labour of the people, will be found. When Stalin noted more Jewish people in the Menshevik rather than Bolshevik faction of the Social Democratic Party, he joked that it wouldn't be a bad idea for the Bolsheviks to arrange a small pogrom in the party. Although Stalin publicly denounced anti-Semitism, it was widely known that he denigrated Jewish people in private. Anti-Jewish racism was prevalent in the Soviet Union where Jewish people were relegated to the political status of people of Jewish ethnicity rather than ordinary Soviet citizens. 
Hence, Jewish people were subject to exacting quotas for secondary education and entry into a range of professions. Unsurprisingly, marginalised Jewish workers in many parts of the world have often been obligated to establish their own trade unions, political parties, labour newspapers and movements due to anti-Jewish racism in socialist movements. Oshelin's philo-Semitism is central to his view of Jewish power. Their mastery of the art of influence in the intellectual world is in his view precisely what has granted them their destructive proximity to power almost as far back as written history, even more so than their command over money. Even after celebrating their intellectual achievements as philosophers, scholars and artists, in inverted commas, Oshelin nevertheless relegates the contributions of these outstanding Jews as within the oppressive realm of capitalist modernity. Oshelin's writings are a useful illustration of how even seemingly complementary descriptions of Jewish people and their accomplishments are not merely compatible with, but are in many, are in many cases a central feature of fundamentally racist worldview about their place in society. Crucially, we must recognise how it remains entirely possible for individuals to feel no hatred or ill will towards a group of people while retaining, uninterrogated, the retrograde views about what they are essentially like that are received from a social order that oppresses that group.